need to do. And that's what I'll be covering today in this session. So my first takeaway to, is this, read this article here and share it with whoever in your organization needs to read some of the things that you discover in that article. This is one of the first things we seem to be getting wrong, transformation or more particularly digital transformation. Everybody seems to be talking about it. Everybody wants it, but nobody really knows what it's about. Here are a few examples of what people say, digital transformation. One thing is true. If you look at all of these uh, words, transformation, all of these are correct. So basically anybody doing any IT project can call it a transformation because it means so many things. One fact is clear, whatever transformation means for you, research shows 70% are gonna fail or not achieve the results they're hoping to get. And there are some of the things I'll look at today. I prefer this word metamorphosis. And why is that? Metamorphosis is a process of transformation from an immature form to an adult form in two or more stages. And that is the point. Now, I don't have time today to present the little model at the top, but basically there I had a model taking us from technology provider through to a service provider, through to an agile organization, through to a product driven organization and ultimately a value stream driven organization. And many organizations currently are struggling for that step between the idle and the service world and the agile and DevOps world. And from the agile and DevOps world to become a more valued business partner, product driven organization, which we heard about earlier on. So this requires one or more stages to get there. It's not a from A to B, it's a continual ongoing journey. Now here's a process that I've been promoting for many years where we seem to be going wrong. Here you'll see lots of people, including McKinsey, talking about mindsets. Matter. Everybody's talking about the importance of mindsets. Or as we've heard today by a couple of presentations, culture. CEOs say they struggle with culture change even though that they know this is going to damage what they do. These are two articles from last year, why every executive should be focusing on culture change. But this is where we go wrong. Changing mindsets isn't going to make a difference. And thinking you can change the culture simply by saying we've got a culture change program is not going to work. What we're missing is this bit in the middle. And I've heard a few of the speakers talk about this earlier on behavior. This is what we really need to be doing. You change attitudes to create buy-in, to adopt new behaviors, sustainable, repeatable, desirable behaviors that eventually become the way we do things around here, fostering a new culture. And you heard a couple of the speakers today talking about engaging people, helping change their attitudes, engaging them so that they can come up with their own behaviors and things that they need to change. So this is what we need to be doing, focus on behavior. I mentioned the State of the Union report. Now, it's an article that I wrote. Basically, what I did was I read all of these reports, the State of DevOps, the State of Agile, Gartner Research, Boston Consulting Group, McKinsey report. I read everything. So you don't need to read these, but if you want to get a copy of my presentation and you can click on each one of these links to open the document. So I analyzed these documents and I analyzed feedback from hundreds of simulation games we played around the world to identify where we currently are at the moment. And we are in this stormy depression here, making that shift towards a more agile, transformed organization to a more product driven organization. And what I identified is this 70% fall short of their objectives. 70% say changing culture is their biggest challenge. 70% don't measure behavior change or the value and impact of training investments. 70% don't have continued improvement as a core strategic capability, not as a process capability or department capability, but as a strategic capability. When asked if they measure the value realized by all the investments, 72% said once, rarely or never. So I've invented this new card. It's called the 70% Stormy Depression Club card. So get a copy of my presentation. And if you recognize any one of these 70% in your department or organization, cut out that card, stick it up on the notice board by the coffee machine, 
And whenever anybody asks, hey, what's this 70% Stormy Depression Club card? You can tell them exactly what it is. And then you can start talking about improvement. So what are five key challenges that I've analyzed from all of those reports? I'm gonna look now one of them at each one at a time and also give you some tips to get rid of them. So here's the first major challenge. Now these are ABC cards, Attitude Behaviour Culture cards, that I've been using to do workshops around the world for the last 20 years. And these are top scoring cards and have been for the last 10 to 15 years. This one on the left, No Understanding Business Impact and Priority, is the number one top scoring card and has been for the last 15 years in a row. You can see how old it is. There you see the IT guy turning up with a floppy disk. My daughters are now 28, 29, and they're asking, what's he holding in his hand? They've never seen a floppy disk. People keep change, asking me to change the cartoon, update it, make it more modern, and I say no. That cartoon's staying there as an indictment to what we do, and it's staying there until I retire. And the good news is I've actually retired now, and that cartoon is still here, and I'm sure it's still going to be around for the next five years. So if you look at these cards, it might be a winning hand in blackjack, but if you recognize any one of these cards, you have to ask yourself, are we gambling with IT in our organization? And indeed, this was the number one challenge from all of those documents stating a poor alignment of our investments to strategic priorities. But it's not just an IT problem. This is also a business problem. If we want digital transformation to work, we can't do this without the business. Now, there's two articles, you can click on these if you download it, that I wrote for Isaka about governance. And one of the things I quoted in there was this one. MIT Sloan survey showed uh, one third of leaders charged with implementing the company strategy could not even list one of their own strategic goals. Yet these are the same business managers all insisting that their IT project has the highest priority. And poor old IT, because we don't understand what priorities are, we're running around unable to achieve everything. Here's my tip. Uh, get hold of the COBIT goals cascade, the best kept secret in the IT industry. Use this to go and interview each of the different business unit leaders, all in, insisting their projects have got the highest priority and come up with a list of priorities. More importantly, you identify conflicts in priorities. This is why without governance, without effective governance, we are never gonna solve this problem. And we as IT are always gonna be chasing around, failing to achieve goals. So there's the first one. Um, but this also applies at operational level. Now, unfortunately, this is a, an online. Normally I do this presentation around the world and I've done a presentation like this to more than 50,000 people. And I normally ask how many of you do in ITIL? and I get about 85% of the hands go up. I then ask, put your hands up if you could tell me the definition of a service according to ITIL, and less than 5% of the hands go up. Why should we know that, people ask. Well, there's the definition of a service, and there's only four words there that every single person in IT needs to know, everybody. Value, outcomes, costs, and risks. Why are we doing these things, particularly ITIL or Agile? Now, in terms of ITIL, some do it for faster time to market. Some do it for improved customer satisfaction. Some do it for efficiency gains, reducing costs. Banks are doing it to manage risks and also hospitals are using it to manage risks. We can't afford critical systems to go down when they're needed. Now, many IT people say, well, we don't need to know that. Well, I had a chief executive officer in one of my workshops and she said, when she saw that none of the IT people knew this definition, then how can you measure that you are getting what you didn't know you were hoping to get in the first place? Which means that these frameworks become the goal in themselves if we don't know what it was we're trying to achieve. And the answer is we don't know, because in a value stream management consortium, 72% replied once, rarely or never do they manage the value, the value, not the outputs, the value of their investments in terms of value, outcomes, costs and risks. There's a new word that's been added to ITIL 4, 
and it's the most powerful word there is, co-creation. It's all about now co-creating. We cannot solve the problems I've just shown you without engaging with the business. And I've seen a couple of the presentations earlier on talking about engaging with all the stakeholders, engaging also with senior management and engaging with the customers and business. Robert also talked about ITSM, DevOps and the customer. But how do you engage with them? Well, there's just three articles you can read from my side. This first one was how we use the ABC cards with a board of directors, a board of directors. A one and a half hour workshop, they were then totally convinced they needed to invest in service portfolio management to manage those business conflicts. Here's one where we did it with a chief executive officer and her business team. They were convinced they needed to, to invest in ITIL 4 after doing this. And an article here is how we engaged with 60 end users, including the mayor of the city, using the ABC cards to say, what are the things that irritate you most that we need to improve? And you heard a great presentation from Trickle, how we could use automation to try to manage this, capturing direct feedback from end users. Les this morning talked about this as well, capturing feedback straight away when we do things so that we can use that feedback for improvement. So there's the first thing. Looks like my my computer's locked up for a minute. Hopefully it's going to come back in a minute while I talk about the, the next one. Let's get rid of that. Okay, here's another tip what you can do and it ties in what people are talking about, engage. Go and make Monday, go and meet a user day. Send everybody from IT, not at the same time, but send everybody from IT into the business to find out how information systems are used and how they support value and outcomes or how they help waste and reduce costs and risks. So send everybody out and have them come back and present to your team what they found or invite the business into your team to explain the problems they're having with information systems. It's a great way of getting feedback. Now, an example of this, which I like, was I think it was one of the, the companies like DHL or UPS in America. They said every single new person in IT goes in the truck for one day. They get up at two in the morning and they find out which information system tells which packages to go to which loading bay, which information system tells the lorry to go to which loading bay, which information system tells you where to load the packages in the van so that they come out first. So when an IT person understands all of the critical business processes supported and enabled by IT in one day, simply by going and sitting down with the users to see how those systems are used. So there's a tip for you to take away. Get people more customer business aware of what we're doing. Seems like my presentation keeps wanting to do things right. Next one. The next one is L is for leadership. These are two top scoring cards as well from our workshops for the last 15 years. Management commitment and managers not walking the talk. I've heard a couple of presentations this morning as well about the need to get managers engaged early up front with these things and the importance of management commitment. But I could have told you this 20 years ago, management commitment is important. You could have told me management commitment is important. Whenever managers see this card, they get angry. But of course we're committed. And this was a second key challenge on all of those documents. Managers insist they're committed. However, when you ask them what does commitment look like, ask them to write down what does commitment look like in terms of behavior for managers, then ask the people at the shop floor what does management commitment look like, and you'll find those behaviors are totally different. Management commitment, here's an article I wrote. I did a workshop with 15 CIOs talking about digital transformation, talking about culture change. And as I say, a few of the speakers have already said today, what we went through was primarily a culture change. I asked 15 CIOs, do you have the skills to manage this type of culture change program and the shift to agile DevOps product driven organizations? All 15 said no. They said we're expected to walk the talk, lead by example, but we don't know what it looks like. 
because this new digitally transformed world is something we've never done before. It's totally new, these end-to-end -end value streams and product teams, it's all new. I then asked the 15 CIOs, does your next level of management now understand how to manage these culture change? The answer was no. And now the key question and the most shocking one for me, I asked them, do you now have leadership development programs in place to teach your middle managers how to manage this type of culture change program, engaging teams, making sure that we can change the culture? All 15 said no. Is it any wonder we keep failing with these programs? Next, here's a tip you can do. Uh, go and define the five key behaviors that demonstrate commitment. And I'll give you a tip. One of those five key behaviors must be reserve time or work in progress time for continual learning and improving. And I think three of the speakers so far have talked about the importance of gaining feedback, gathering feedback, learning and improving so that the next time we don't make the same mistakes. And the next time, hopefully, we don't meet the challenges I'm talking about here at the moment. There's another article you can click on, and this was three senior leadership teams. They went through some business simulations and discovered, oh my goodness, these are the types of behaviours we now need to be displaying to support the rest of the organisation going through their culture change. So there's another article you can look at if you like. Uh, a last tip for this one is, uh, the DevOps Agile uh, Skills Association uh, have come up with a leadership program and it's a leadership program developed by CIOs for managers. These were CIOs that actually went through this complex type of culture change and transformation and all of the things they learned they put into this program, the DASA leadership program. So have a look at that if you're interested in developing your skills. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. We've turned this into a core capability into IT. We love making the same mistakes over and over again, as can be evidenced by these five key challenges I keep meeting. ITIL is the objective, not what it should achieve. Certification means I know what I'm doing. This was the third key challenge from those top five not investing in the right skill sets and talents. Now, people have always complained to me that I'm against certification, the ITIL, DevOps, Agile, the massive hunt for certificates. I'm not. Whilst there is value in a certificate, there's more value in being able to apply theory in practice in the context of solving a business problem. And that's the bit we fail to do. Now, I wrote these two articles the most controversial articles I've ever written in my career and I got a lot of feedback from everybody. So I suggest you have a look at those and it talks about this massive hunt for certificates. The second document introduces what's called the eight field model. It's not my model, it's a model I've adopted. Consultants love models and this is my pet model. It's called the eight field model. I even wrote a white paper for this on the Axos website uh, you could have clicked on it, but Axos has deleted it because apparently it's not important enough. And I'm going to explain what it is. This eight field model, very briefly, the right hand side talks about evaluating training. Now, the bottom level, the learning process, we're all very good at that. I think ITSMF might even give you a form to fill in after this. What did you think of the presentations? Did they meet your objectives? Was the session long enough? Was it too long? We all score this, it's great. The next level up for evaluating is, uh, did we actually learn what we set out to learn, test or prove? We in ITIL are brilliant at this because there's two million ITIL certificates. We put people through training, give them multiple choice questions to demonstrate that they've proven they've learned what we hope to learn. Now the tricky bit, the next level up, do we see the new learning being applied in terms of new behaviours in the workplace. And finally, the top one is, can we now see as a result of the training, a difference in value, outcomes, costs and risks that we hope to achieve? Here's a Harvard Business Study. Oh, oh sorry, what's happened here? Let's go back to 
this one. Harvard Business Study also showed uh, very similar results to what we were getting when we did a survey of 4,000 companies. Only 12% of employees apply new skills learned in learning and development programs because we just pump them through to get the certificates. And only 25% of respondents actually said training measurably improved performance, yet we pump out millions and millions of these certificates. There's an article that explains how to use the eight field model. Here's my recommendation, use this model Ask for more practical exercises in training. We heard in the beginning for listening on the job training, coaching, mentoring people on how to use new systems or how to use new methods that they've learned. Start measuring. I'll show you that in a minute. Here's another new training I recommend anybody that's a team leader or manager, anybody that's responsible or wants to bring about a culture change, which is supported by behavior change, there's a two day training here called OBM, Organizational Behavior Management Training, strongly recommended to teach you how to solve many of these problems. And in our shiny new thing that really helps global survey in the last year, I've also found out that 72% don't have end to end representation in training. We'll send the IT ops people to ITIL training, we'll send the dev people to DevOps training, and even these conferences, we send our IT ops people to the ITIL conferences and we send the DevOps to the DevOps conferences. Whereas we've heard from Robert and we've heard from Les this morning also the importance of engaging end to end stakeholders, learning together how to solve these things. So this is a poor capability we have. In terms of measuring, Here's an example where we put, we discussed the eight field model with a customer. We put them through the Mars lander of business simulation and we identified what is the key behaviors that they're trying to change. What we did then was we measured. We measured after a couple of months, do we see the behavior change actually taking place in terms of I do things differently. I see my colleagues doing things differently. And after the training, it scored very, very low in the first two months because nobody was embedding the coaching, mentoring, learning, feedback, helping people apply the new skills. So eventually leaders started coaching and they put coaches in. And then after the next measurement period, you could see that each of the behaviors was improving. More consistent behaviors. That's measuring this level. More importantly, what did it mean in terms of value and outcomes? This was in a hospital, it was a European one. First call resolution from 65 to 75 represented 40,000 calls. Typical, typical IT metrics, internal metrics. But what did it mean in terms of revenue, value outcomes, costs and risks? They saved 250,000 euros costs of expensive second level support who were then able to work on more innovation work and equally, those calls that were solved quicker were all ones focused on improving patient care and safety because they were all related to information systems supporting medical equipment or information systems supporting uh, uh, access to information for patients online or getting the right information when they needed it. So there's an example of applying the eight field model. There's an article that you can click on that shows how to do this as well. I cannot stress the importance of the eight field model enough for anybody that's thinking of investing now in major tra training programs and training up people. Next, let's get to the culture of uh, communication and collaboration are make or break. We've heard about this in the first two speeches this morning, Les and Robert, both talking about the importance of engaging people, both talking about the importance of collaboration. We heard Les talking about the importance of communicating, communicating consistently. Uh, here's some things that I've come up with. We listen to give an answer rather than to listen to understand. You'll often hear people when someone's talking say, yes, but, yes, but, and we make assumptions. I call it a suicide. Assuming that we know what is meant, it causes waste, delays, frustration. And when we talk about collaboration, 
Nobody knows what collaboration means, yet we all put wonderful posters up on the wall. We're collaborative, we're team-based, we're team-working, one team. We put these things up, but nobody knows what does it actually mean. So what can we do about that? Culture was indeed the number four barrier from all the reports I read. And I'm pleased to hear that a number of the speakers were talking about basically what we did was a culture change. And they gave you some great tips to so get hold of their presentations. They gave some great tips about what to do in culture with meetings, face to face meetings, get managers involved in the meetings, get enter and teams involved in the meetings so that we can communicate better. Uh, one thing we need to do here is develop our active listening skills so that we stop assuming and we can start improving our understanding. And here's something we do in all of our simulation games. Um, what we do in our simulation games is we get people together end to end in a room to play a game. And I'll ask them, what does effective collaboration look like? What behaviours will we see? And I get them to write on a flip over what behaviours. And here they say we prioritise based on goals, we confer blah de blah de blah de blah. They write it down and I say to them, OK, is this how you, you as a team, now want to behave for the rest of the day in this game? Yes, they say. We then play the game and within half an hour they've totally ignored these behaviours. And at the end of the first round, I reflect back, who do I blame for this? And they all say, the managers. And I say, wait a minute, there's not a single manager in this room. You're the ones that said, this is how you want to behave. Yet none of you stuck to the behavior. None of you gave each other feedback on the behaviors. And none of you ensured that we're coaching, supporting each other to apply these new behaviors. That's how difficult culture change is embedding these behaviors. And as Aristotle said thousands of years ago, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, it's a habit. It's things we need to embed and do consistently. How long does it take to change behavior? Scientifically, it's not proven, but some research say six weeks. One customer we had did actually do this. He said it took us six weeks to create behavior change. What they did was they chose three behaviors from this list. Just three, like timely notifications, we ask for help, we give feedback and they practice them consistently in every interaction between people, between people and their managers, between teams. And in every team meeting, they practice these. Wait a minute, I thought we said we'd give feedback. You're not giving feedback. Wait a minute, I thought we'd ask for help. Why didn't you ask for help when you were struggling? So if we consistently practice them, they do become a habit the way we do things here, which is the culture we're trying to create. Somebody talked about as well, getting teams together, ITSM and DevOps. Now, a great example here is get people together to map end to end flows. How does work flow from the business request through to the agile teams, through to the ops teams and through to the end user? Now, this is a joke. Uh, image that I made that sort of rotates. I'm not going to talk about the whole thing, but this shows you how badly we apply end to end flow of work. So a great example to practice effective collaboration and get an end to end team together for one of your products that flows all the way through the organization. Map it with sticky post-it notes on the wall. How quickly do things go through? Where are we wasting time? How often do we ping pong backwards and forwards? And how often do we ping pong up and down the management level before we get things working? And you'll find some shocking discoveries and a great way to communicate and collaborate. And there was one example that we heard this morning about this uh, one creating one team, getting ITSM DevOps customer together to agree that the way we're going to work together. In terms of communication, here was some research from uh, lean software development. Companies lose 50% of knowledge in every handover. This means after five handovers, only 3% of the total amount of information is still there which means I guess I'll just have to assume we make assumptions. I made some metrics as a joke. Uh, I meant them as a joke in my presentation, but one organization phoned up a few months later and said, we've started applying all of these and they're making a big difference. Reducing the number of yes buts in a meeting. Check next time in a meeting how many questions are unanswered. 
reduction in number of interruptions, increasing the other two things. So we need to improve the way we communicate, which was mentioned earlier on. This is uh, one of my favorites, and I think this is something that can really make a difference. It's uh, principles. Now, lots of organizations are talking about principles, and Agile talks about principles, DevOps talks about principles, ITIL talks about principles. Now, usually they're served, they're used to, as a foundation for a system of belief, where really it must be a system of behavior. I'll show you what I mean here. These are the principles of Agile, these are the principles of DevOps, these are Lean, these are ITIL, everybody's talking about these, blah, 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 again, posters on the wall. I've analyzed these. Finally, this is what can bring us together to collaborate, to become one team. All of these frameworks have three things in column. Com common. They all have a focus on customer value. They all talk about collaboration and flow, and they all talk about continual learning and improving. What we need to do is translate each of these into the five to seven key behaviors that represent this. There's some articles that do this. The bottom article is something I wrote for a CIO site, which I recommend you give a link to your CIO. And what you now need to do is go away and define for each of these three key areas, what are the behaviors we want to learn and unlearn in terms of these three things. Talking of continual improvement, a number of the speakers have talked about this, which I'll show you in a minute. There's another top scoring card from our global workshops. In our findings, only 20% were formally doing CSI continual service improvement. If I ask at conferences, often people say we're doing it until I ask them this. Are you doing it top down and left to right? Very few hands go up. Yet it's been proven that if we consistently do this, we can get 29% more effort and, and results from our work. We can do 29% more things. Again, these were findings from the State of the Union report, McKinsey's finding Boston Consulting. You heard from this morning in the first presentation how they've actually put this in place. They put this continual learning cycle in place, gathering feedback and making improvements. You heard the trickle presentation with broken windows, two brilliant examples for how you must put this sort of things in place and make it a core capability. Governance, a personal group of people account to the highest level of performance. Here's a great quote that I love, the governing body should also have visibility the outcomes of continual improvement activities and the measurement of value. Again, in my, on face-to-face -face conferences, I ask people, anybody know where this came from? Nobody knows. This comes from the ITIL Foundation Manual for four. So even at this level, they're talking about, you've got to have this as a core capability and it's got to feed right up into governance so the whole organization is continually adopting and learning and improving. Make progress iteratively with feedback, a core capability. Put some of these frameworks in place that you've seen other speakers talk about today. Visualize improvements. You saw Trickle, they've got it an online thing. You saw other people talking about putting them on boards on the wall. Visualize it so that they're continually visible. Tick them off every time they occur. Get people to prioritize them as you heard. And you don't find the time to do continued improvement. You make the time. That's why it's one of the five core behaviors for management commitment. If managers do not commit to giving teams time to get together, to capture improvement needs, to prioritize the top five, and then allocate resources, you're never going to get it done. I did a, a survey on these five areas last year. And these were the results of the survey. I did a global survey, 25 different countries were involved. And I asked in each of these core key questions to score bad, poor, weak, okay, good or great. And as you can see on just about every question, we either score weak or below. That's the global situation. Get a copy of this presentation and do a quick mini survey within your own organization to say, how well do we score on each of these? These underpin the five key areas I've talked about. What is the shiny new thing that really helps? Well, basically, we wrote this book called the ABC of ICT 20 years ago. 
whenever I offer to give a presentation now on ABC of ICT, people say, no, we've done that, Paul, 20 years ago. Haven't you got anything shiny and new like DevOps or Agile or hybrid working? We've done ABC. So what I did was I simply replaced the title of the book and called it the shiny new thing that really helps. And now I've been invited all around the world to give the ABC presentation again. Proves my point, we love shiny new things. And finally, another top scoring card, not my responsibility. Now, 60 to 80 people might be sitting here listening and 60 to 80 of you may have actually seen something in my presentation that you want to take away. I usually ask people, put up your hands if you're going to do something with what you've learned. I usually get about 30, 40 percent of the hands go up and then I say, rubbish, I don't believe you. None of you is going to make a difference because very few organizations have got the continual improvement mechanisms in place to actually take away what they've learned today to get the rest of the organization to buy in. So you must be the change you wish to see in the world, as Gandhi said. So hopefully there's something in the presentation that you want to take away. I wanted to make a T-shirt for this saying I am a strategic asset. Something went wrong with the fonts and it came out like this. So if you do actually take something away to make an improvement that you've seen today, you will become a strategic asset. If you just make a list of things and you don't take away and improve, then good luck to you. And there is no install the shiny new thing that really helps button. This is hard work, effort, practice, feedback and continual learning and improvement. So that's it. That's my presentation for now. So thanks very much. I'll stop the sharing and give it back over to Chris to see whether there's any questions or 